Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I'm Emily Parsons, the Deputy Director and Curator for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. Delighted to welcome you to this Lunch Bite, our monthly series of object talks highlighting treasures from our collections. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation of the achievement of American independence by supporting advanced study, presenting exhibitions and public programs, advocating preservation and providing resources to classrooms. Since 1938, the Society of the Cincinnati has done this work from its headquarters, Anderson House, a National Historic Landmark finished in 1905 as a winter residence of Lars and Isabel Anderson in Washington, DC. Today's Lunch Bite features Andrew Outen discussing two maps of the Battle of Brandywine, produced by English cartographer and publisher, William Fadden in 1778 and 1784, which are preserved in our library collections. Andrew is the Historical Programs Manager for the American Revolution Institute, having joined our staff just almost a year ago in October 2021. Prior to that, he spent nine years as Director of Education and Museum Services for the Brandywine Battlefield Park Associates. Brandywine is obviously a subject close to his heart, and I think we're in for a treat today to hear his new research into the origins of and relationship between these two maps. Before I turn things over to Andrew, let me go over a few housekeeping items for those of you tuning in today via Zoom. After the talk, we will have a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit your questions for Andrew using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to incorporate them with our live audience questions. Should you have any technical related questions or comments, those can be submitted using the chat functions and our staff will do their best to assist you. Now, please join me in welcoming Andrew Outen. Thank you, Emily, and thank you all for joining me for this Lunch Bite this afternoon. Um, as Emily stated, today we are going to be uh, discussing two maps produced by British cartographer uh, William Fadden depicting the Battle of Brandywine from our library collections. Uh, this Lunch Bite will focus on recent research that I've done to answer several questions surrounding these maps, particularly the sources that were used to produce them. Uh, to date, little work has been done to investigate the background of these maps and the reasoning as to why it these two maps depicting the same battle that were produced six years apart. Now, throughout my research, fascinating information has been uncovered to help us answer those questions surrounding their background and fosters, and fosters a better understanding of Fadden's pro production process surrounding them and his other well-known maps from the Revolutionary War. So before we start, I must inform you that this is a work in progress, this project, and uh, we'll, we will only be covering everything that I have researched and found so far. So William, William Fadden was one of the most respected and well-established British cartographers in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Throughout his illustrious career, he created over 300 maps, atlases, and military plans, but his most well-known work came from his focus on the Revolutionary War. Throughout the Eight-Year War, Fadden's maps kept a very curious British public informed of the conflict and the events that were transpiring in North America and across the globe. One such map was Fadden's 1778 commemoration map depicting the, the British victory at the Battle of Brandywine, a map that was again unusually reproduced with several changes and additions in 1784. Before we discuss the battle and these maps further, it's important to understand the typical process Fadden undertook to produce these maps. As Fadden never stepped foot in North America, he had to rely on various sources of information, such as firsthand sketches manus and manuscripts from people who were there. So where and how did Fadden typically obtain his information for these Revolutionary War battle maps? One of Fadden's most useful outlets came from his partnership with Thomas Jeffries Jr., the son of another influential 18th century cartographer, Thomas Jeffries Sr. Thomas Jeffries Sr., depicted in this portrait on the right, revolutionized 18th century cartography. His notoriety and reputation mainly originated from his maps of North America following the Seven Years' War and Great Britain's extensive gain of new territory. His maps of North America eventually led him led to his appointment as geographer to the king, a title that you will hear at various stages throughout various stages of this presentation. Now, this title may seem to imply some form of royal authority, but in reality, it offered no monetary compensation from the government and was essentially only a highly regarded title within the small map making community. 
The only powers it did allow the bearer were exclusive access to the royal collections or government archives and the ability to retail maps directly to the royal family. Thomas Jeffries Jr. inherited this title from his father following his father's death in 1771, but prior to that, Fadden's father, a wealthy and well-known London printer, was able to secure Fadden as a partner in the Jeffries firm. That, that, uh, that would make Fad, uh, that Fadden would eventually uh, take full ownership of by 1776, giving him total access to the map collections of that firm. Another key source of Fadden's information throughout the war was through his vast network of contacts that was, comp that was comprised of officers, engineers, and surveyors in the military. In any, in any nation's modern military, surveys or manuscripts produced during an armed conflict would be considered somewhat classified and certainly would not be accessible uh, to the public for reproduction until a later date. In the 18th century British military, however, it was an entirely different situation as there was no defined policy concerning the publication of materials from uh, official surveys, such as those conducted for the Board of Ordnance, and very few rules were put in place to stop officers from having their surveys published during their duties, which they often took advantage of. So with that useful way of employing uh, private capital with government property, surveys and maps from officers and engineers fighting in North America act as, uh, acted as some of the best sources uh, for Fadden to produce maps depicting events of the American Revolution. When Fadden received or compiled his sources, he would work up a draft and add his own aesthetics, such as an elaborate cartouche with the map's title, a key, a scale to denote distances, troop positions, and, and a description to explain the map's various depictions. Once a final draft was established, Fadden would then engrave his work onto a copper plate that he would use to print the maps on a mass scale. This was all accomplished through Fadden's employment of skilled craftsmen who each played an in integral role throughout the production process. Notwithstanding the time it took to get information across the Atlantic, let alone the time it took to produce the maps, Fadden's success and high regard stemmed from his ability to produce maps of recent battles or events very quickly and shortly after they had taken place. The maps of Brandywine that we are going to discuss today went through that same process. But before we analyze and discuss them, I would be remiss if I didn't give you a crash course on the battle itself. Fought on September 11, 1777 in East southeastern Pennsylvania, the Battle of Brandywine was the largest single day land battle of the Revolutionary War, where almost 30,000 soldiers contended for nearly 14 hours over 35,000 acres of land. As Washington's army attempted to repel a much larger British force under the command of General Sir William Howe and prevent Howe from capturing the colonial capital of Philadelphia. To accomplish this, Washington established a formidable defensive line on the eastern side of the Brandywine River. He positioned his main defense on the advantageous high ground at Chad's Ford, where a major thoroughfare that was Howe's last avenue of approach to Philadelphia crossed the river. He also established a defensive network that stretched for nearly eight miles to protect other crossing points on the river to the north and south. Washington and his generals thought their, uh, thought their dispositions were defensible, but despite their diligent preparation, their line was not secure, as General Howe would soon prove. Unlike Washington, Howe took advantage of a local population that was largely made up of loyalists. Loyalists provided valuable intelligence that enabled Howe to discover the Achilles heel of Washington's seemingly formidable defense of the Brandywine River. Washington really had neglected to um, guard two vital crossing points on the forks of the Brandywine that you can see up to the north. Uh, these are called Trimble's and Jeffrey's Ford, both approximately 10 miles north of Washington's main position at Chad's Ford. Uh, and again, they were left entirely unguarded, leaving Washington's defense completely exposed on the right and the rear door of his army's position wide open. Howe attempted to capitalize on the, Americans, on the American commander's mistake. He pl his plan called for a pincer movement of two columns that each set out in the early morning hours of September 11th from the small village of Kennett Square, six miles to the west of Washington's position. The first column was intended to be a feint and was led by Hessian General, uh, Hessian Lieutenant General uh, Wilhelm von Knipphausen. This column was made up of approximately 6,000 soldiers that were ordered to march along the main thoroughfare to Philadelphia, directly at Washington's main position at Chad's Fort. Simultaneously, Generals Howe and Cornwallis led a larger column on a daunting 15-mile flanking march to cross the Brandywine River at the two unguarded forts. This movement would place their column in the rear of Washington's lines. The two columns would then coordinate their attacks to trap and smash Washington's army from the front and rear. Uh, 
The, through this morning hours and into the early afternoon, Washington engaged Knipphausen's column, but he could not ascertain whether it was the entire British army directly across from him on the west side of the river or simply a small detachment of it. Early in the day, Knipphausen unleashed an intense cannonade to maintain the ruse, and this kept Washington at bay and allowed Howe and Cornwallis's northern flanking column of nearly 12,000 soldiers to cross the Brandywine River unopposed and undetected. Confusion quickly set in for the American leadership. Throughout Knipphausen's bombardment, Washington scouts delivered contradictory reports that failed to give him a clear picture of what was transpiring. Without a clear understanding of what was uh, going on to the north, Washington cautiously held his army at their main defensive position at Chad's Ford. By two o'clock, Washington finally had a definitive answer to the question that he had exasp that it exasperated him all day. When C Colonel Theodore Bland of the First Continental Light Dragoons rushed into his headquarters, reporting that the entirety of Howe's forces was not in front of Washington Chet's Ford, but behind him in his rear. Fortunately for Washington, the large flanking column had stopped to refresh itself after a long and arduous march in the searing September heat, giving him time to react. Washington immediately ordered three divisions under the, the command of Generals Adam Stephen, William Alexander Sterling, and eventually John Sullivan to abandon their positions along the Brandywine River and rush their men to a piece of high ground behind the Birmingham Quaker Meeting House known as Birmingham Hill, approximately three miles north of Chad's Ford and directly across from the British position. With little difficulty, Stevens and Sterling's divisions successfully arrived atop Birmingham Hill and formed as the right and center of the American line. Sullivan's division followed suit to form its left, but for reasons that range from inexperienced leadership and poor discipline to difficult terrain, they found themselves entirely out of position with a large gap between their right flank and Sterling's left flank. This misadventure was a cause of the event was a cause of the eventual breakdown of Washington's forces atop Birmingham Hill later in the afternoon. Notwithstanding Sullivan's blunder and the numerous waves of Howe's elite brigade, uh, brigade of guards, grenadiers and light infantry attempting to dislodge them, the Americans held their ground for nearly an hour and a half. But in the aftermath of this brave and shockingly effective stand, the three divisions began to break, which ultimately culminated in a frantic retreat towards the small village of Dilworth to the east. The, the scene was no different at Chad's Ford. As Howe's main column assaulted the three American divisions atop Birmingham Hill, Knipphausen launched an assault across the Brandywine River. With only Anthony Wayne's Pennsylvanians, William Maxwell's light infantry, John Armstrong's militia, and Nathaniel Green's two brigades in reserve, the American position began to crumble. By early evening, Washington's two lines were being overrun from the north and west. He had no other choice but to withdraw his forces before his line of retreat was completely cut off. The Continental Army's salvation at Brandywine came in the form of Nathaniel Green. Washington ordered Green and his division to conduct a quick march south of the village of Dilworth to provide support for the retreating American divisions that were being entirely routed from Birmingham Hill. Green did this in record time and was able to position his 1st Virginia Brigade under General George Whedon in an advantageous position that was out of sight to the British pursuers, allowing them to set up a deadly enfilade, in this case, fire from three sides. To maintain his momentum and land a knockout blow to Washington's forces, Howe ordered the elite grenadiers of the 2nd Grenadier Battalion to continue its pursuit of the retreating Americans. As the grenadiers pushed their way across the field, they were unknowingly being lured into a vicious trap. They quickly found themselves in, in fully in, uh, enveloped by the left side of Whedon's enfilade. The initial effect of Whedon's formation was so devastating that the 2nd Grenadier Battalion's commander sought out immediate support that came from two regiments of the British 4th Brigade that were being held in reserve throughout, throughout the day's fighting. Unfortunately for these two regiments, they also fell victim to Whedon's trap. Soon after being brought up to support the Grenadiers, they were surprised to have marched into the right side of, of the enfilade that was turned in at 90 degrees. Overwhelmed and exhausted after marching 17 miles throughout the day, Howe's forces were ordered to halt and not pursue the American forces any farther. Uh, this allowed Washington to withdraw from the field in an orderly retreat and keep the American cause of independence intact. So now that you're all experts on, on Brandywine uh, and can now properly judge these maps, let's start with uh, by analyzing them. Uh, and we'll begin with the 1778 map entitled Battle of Brandywine, in which the rebels were defeated September 11, 1777, by the army under the command of General Sir William Howe, produced by Fadden on April 13, 1778. Now, at first glance, one can see that it shows two explanations of the battle, one for the northern portion pertaining to Cornwallis's column and the and the operations under col, uh, under the column of the 
under the command of His Excellency Lieutenant General uh, Knipphausen, which is engraved from a plan drawn on the spot by S.W. Werner, Lieutenant of Hessian Artillery. Now to note, Fadden and other map makers consistently use words such as drawn on the spot to add credibility to their maps. For this map, we can definitively say that its overall topographical survey stems from Captain John Montresor. Uh, from the outset of the war in 1775, Montresor was the most qualified engineer in the British Army. Aside from a brief period where he was superseded as chief engineer by a Captain Matthew Dixon from 1776 through early 1777, Montresor held the title of chief engineer from the opening shots of the war through 1778. Following the Battle of Brandywine, the British camped in the area for five days, and during that time, accounts show that multiple engineers and surveyors scoured the 35,000-acre battlefield landscape to make note of the grounds. Montresor's journal entry from September 14th reflects this, as he wrote, persons during the campaign were constantly employed under the chief engineer in surveying the roads, the army marches, and their encampments and fields of battle. This is also confirmed by another well-known British engineer who can be considered as Montresor's right-hand man in 1777, Captain Archibald Robertson, in his diary of September 15th, writing uh, that he was for three days employed taking a sketch of the ground where the Battle of Brandywine was fought. Now, in the Library of Congress, there are four manuscript drafts of Fadden's 1778 Brandywine map that are pictured here and show the various stages of the map's design process. That's it right there. Okay. Um, now, out of those four, these two are solely attributed to Montresor, according to the Library of Congress's records. Now, of these two, this preliminary draft shows the topographical survey, an explanation on the right, the early stages of a title box, and notes pertaining to the various regiments of the British forces in the northern theater of the battle. Like the others, it also appears to show the beginning stages of troop placements in that section of the battlefield. If the Library of Congress's sole attributions to Montresor are correct, that would imply that everything on the maps were done by Montresor. But in reality, the only part of these drafts that should be attributed to Montresor is the topographical survey. Now, to show this, let's zoom in on the map and look at the location of where the heaviest fighting occurred in the afternoon along Birmingham Hill. Now, using the Birmingham Meeting House as a reference, which is circled in red, one can clearly see that these troops that the arrow is pointing to uh, are clearly meant to denote Sullivan's wing, uh, and they are just north and forward of the Meeting House. It is highly doubtful that Montresor would have placed Sullivan's troops there, as according to Montresor's own accounts, uh, this would contradict this troop placement here. Now, on September 12th, Montresor wrote a memorandum of the battle in addition to a long summary uh, on the evening of the 11th. Regarding the Americans' position on Birmingham Hill, Montresor wrote in the memorandum that it was in a, a most adva advantageous position on the heights in the rear of the Birmingham Meeting House with the village of Dilworth on their right. Again, this map clearly shows that Sullivan's forces are placed forward of the meeting house. These are clearly Fadden's additions to Montresor's manuscript. So again, Montresor did the topographical survey, but Fadden is responsible for the other additions and notes. So the sole attribution to Montresor is incorrect. With the sole attribution to Montresor being incorrect, Fadden clearly wasn't getting all of his information from the chief engineer. And this brings up the question of what sources uh, he was using. To answer this, we must look at Fadden's explanation for Cornwallis's column, as that was key to uncovering his source of information uh, that influenced the information conveyed on his map. Now, news of Brandywine had started to reach the eyes of the British public as early as the middle of October, but those news sources simply indicated that a conflict had taken place and offered no further ex uh, explanation or uh, extensive detail. Uh, on December 2nd, 1777, the London Gazette published by authority the first detailed article that gave an in-depth overview of the battle. The article begins with, yesterday morning, Major Kyler, first aide de camp to General Howe, arrived from Philadelphia with the dispatches uh, to, Lord, to Lord George Germain, of which the following copies are extracts. The following is the section that describes Cornwallis's column in the Northern Theater. 
The other column under the command of Lord General uh, Lord Cornwallis, Major General Gray, Brigadier Generals Matthew and Matthew and Agnew, consisting of the mounted and dismounted chasseurs, two squadrons of the 16th Light Dragoons, two battalions of light infantry, two battalions of the guards, the third and fourth brigades with four light 12 pound uh, pounders and the artillery of the brigades marched about 12 miles to the forks of the Brandywine, crossed the first branch at Trimble's Ford and the second at Jeffrey's Ford about two o'clock in the afternoon, taking from thence the road to Dilworth in order to turn the enemy's right at Chad's Ford. General Washington, having intelligence of this movement about noon, detached General Sullivan to his right with near 10,000 men who took a strong position on the commanding ground above Birmingham Church. With his left near the Brandywine, both flanks being covered by very thick woods and his artillery advantageously disposed. As soon as this was observed, which was about four o'clock, the king's troops advanced in three columns and upon approaching the enemy formed the line with the right towards Br the Brandywine. The guards being upon the right and the British grenadiers upon their left, supported by the Hessian grenadiers in a second line. To the left of the center uh, were the two battalions of the light infantry with the Hessian and Anspach chasseurs, supported by the 4th Brigade, the 3rd Brigade forward into reserve. Lord Cornwallis, having formed the line, the light infantry and chasseurs began the attack. The guards and grenadiers instantly advanced from the right, the whole under a heavy fire of artillery and musketry, but they pushed on with impetuosity not to be sustained by the enemy, who falling back into the woods in the rear, the king's troops entered with them and pursued them closely for, for near two miles. After th this success, a part of the enemy's right took a second position in a wood about a half a mile from the Dilworth, from whence the second light infantry and chasseurs soon dislodged them. From this time, they did not rally again in force. The first grenadiers of the Hessian grenadiers and the and the guards, having in having in the pursuit got entangled in a very thick woods, were no farther engaged uh, during that day. The light infantry, the second grenadiers, and the fourth brigade moved forward a mile beyond Dilworth, where they attacked a corps of the enemy that had not been before engaged and were strongly posted to cover the retreat of their army by the roads from Chad's Ford uh, to Chester and Wilmington which corps not being forced until after dark when the troops had undergone much fatigue and a march of 17 miles besides what they had what they supported since the commencement of the attack the enemy's army escaped a total overthrow that must have been the consequence of an hour's more daylight the third brigade was not brought into action but was kept in reserve in the rear of the fourth brigade nor was there an opportunity of employing cavalry now, when comparing uh, Fadden's explanation with this newspaper article, the first full account of the Battle of Brandywine published by authority, it is blatantly obvious that Fadden used it as the basis for his map's explanation uh, surrounding this portion of the battle. And it clearly influenced where he positioned uh, the various troop placements on his um, map. Now, using the Birmingham Meeting House as a reference point again, let's now look at it uh, while using this newspaper account to understand Fadden's justification for these troop placements. I go back to the quote, General Washington, having intelligence of this movement about noon, detached General Sullivan to his right with near 10,000 men who took a strong position on the commanding ground above Birmingham Church with his left near the Brandywine, both flanks being covered by a very thick woods and his artillery advantageously disposed. To Fadden, a map maker who looks at maps in the matter of north is up, south is down, east is right, west is left, the word above would apply that Sullivan's men were north of the meeting house. To Montresor or any other British participant, especially General Howe, from whom this account is from, above doesn't imply the same direction. Now, above is simply referring to the high ground of, of above Birmingham Hill, uh, or which is Birmingham Hill, uh, that the American forces occupied, which is was technically above the meeting house from the British perspective, as remember, they are attacking from the north and moving south. The same goes for the description pertaining to the American rearguard in the latter stages of the battle, denoted by the H's. Uh, the newspaper article states that the 2nd Light Infantry, 2nd Grenadiers, and 4th Brigade moved forward a mile beyond Dilworth, where they attacked a corps of the enemy that had not been uh, before engaged. Again, thinking like a map maker, if you look where the H's are on this map, Fadden did show this action took place beyond Dilworth, but again to the north. Again, to the British participants, beyond Dilworth would be south of the village as a, uh, because they were attacking from the north. 
The information in the newspaper article appears to be accurate, but Fadden clearly misinterpreted it and, clear, and created obvious inaccuracies as a result. So with that, most, if not all of the true positions of the Northern Action are wrong, including the position of the British forces before they launched their attack, as they would have been on either side of this main road, Birmingham Road, the route that Cornwallis's column traversed to get to this area from the northern fords they crossed earlier. Now, aside from the name of the source, the most accurate portion of this uh, 1778 map is the description of the day's action relating to Knipphausen's column, a description that, again, is uh, attributed to uh, from a plan drawn on the spot by S.W. Werner. In fact, it actually should be F.W. Werner for Frederick Wilhelm uh, Werner, a first lieutenant in the Hessian Field Artillery, who on January 30th, 1776, was appointed as brigade adjutant to the Artillery Corps uh, to uh, going to America. After Brandywine, he was promoted to captain on February 9th, 1778, but sadly was never able to return to Germany as he died of illness in 1781. Now, throughout his time in America, Werner produced several sketches and manuscripts, um, and this sketch from Brandywine, currently housed in the Hessian State Archives, and the basis for Fadden's explanation for Knipphausen's column was included in Knipphausen's October 1777 report to Landgraf Frederick II. Werner's survey is surprisingly accurate in terms of topographical features and true positions, but is somewhat crude and does appear uh, to show some flaws. One such flaw is his directional orientation, which is understandable as it shows how Werner could have perceived his own movements throughout the day and the five-day encampment after. Most notable is Werner's compass that provides terrible mis uh, misdirection, as what is noted as north on the map is in most cases actually east. The Great Nottingham Road, on which Knipphausen's column marched from Kennett Square to Chad's Ford, runs east uh, east and west, which is correctly depicted here according to the compass, but everything else is off and reflects a directional orientation of north and south. One reason for this error could be that Werner's artillery company was part of a portion of Knipphausen's column that was broken off from the rest of the column to deploy on the west side of the Brandywine across from Britain's Ford. Britain's Ford was another ford just north of Chad's Ford that required access from a road that ran north from Knipphausen's main avenue of approach to the Brandywine River. Now, to give you a better visual of this, here is an 18th century road map produced by the Chester County Archives that shows the roads that existed at the time of the Battle of Brandywine. You can see where Britain's Bridge Road runs to connect Britain's Ford on the Brandywine River. This northern turn, before heading east again to approach the Brandywine River, could have easily obstructed Warner's sense of direction. Additionally, the curved nature of the road after crossing the Brandywine at Chad's Ford also shows Werner's sense of direction and location, and that his location was obstructed. But this again is understandable with his movements during the, uh, the battle and in the days following. The fact that there are so many manuscript maps of this 1778 map shows Fadden's attempt to commemorate this great British victory as accurate as possible. But with so many errors, we, we, begin to, we can begin to better understand the need for his 1784 revisions. Also housed in the Library of Congress's map collection is the engraver is this engraver's proof that provides evidence that Fadden attempted to correct and update his 1778 map. Errors were common with cartography at this time, and maps were typically corrected and updated in minor ways, such as adding or deleting a word, sentence, or perhaps even placing a symbol somewhere to denote something better. Fadden's extensive corrections and updates shown on this proof were not common, however, and the resulting final product could be classified as an entirely new map. So what could have prompted him to make such extensive changes? Now, with errors, again, being so common in the 18th century, uh, especially, uh, especially when map makers like Fadden were relying on compiled and conflicting sources to depict places they had never been before, um, by 1784, British participants were, were starting to return home, and first-hand accounts could have been more attainable, along with conducting simple interviews. Uh, with a map celebrating one of the British bi biggest British victories of the war that saw so many participants, uh, the mass-produced 1778 map uh, version of this map was more than likely subjected to being picked apart in a manner like we just did. This happened quite frequently. Uh, to give you some examples, in 1766, following the French and Indian War, uh, John Montresor himself returned to London and sold several of his drafted maps to two publishers. According to his journal, he was constantly attending at the two engravers and still found 31 errors. Similarly, 
Thomas Jefferson, while stationed in Paris in 1787, sent his own map of Virginia to a London engraver. Apparently, his first choice was Fadden, but upon learning of Fadden's cost of 50 pounds to engrave it, he went with a different contractor, and much to his regret, he found 172 errors, and his secretary found 63 more. Now, in addition to this, Fadden could have uh, made these changes to not only enhance the map's accuracy, but its appeal. Even throughout the Revolutionary War, Fadden was trading with other European nations, including the French. Correspondence from one French map seller, Latre, shows that Fadden's Brandywine map wasn't selling well. In 1780, Latre requested six copies of Fadden's most recent uh, Atlas of North America. Fadden obliged him, but also sent him copies of some of his battle maps. A year later, Latre sent back two sets of the battle maps, Bunker Hill and Brandywine, with a letter stating that he did not order these and they do not sell. It could be that, um, that an American loss was not a popular map for the American uh, allies, but like the British, the French public was also obviously very interested in what was transpiring across the Atlantic. Regardless, Fadden obviously found it necessary to make these extensive changes that, it, that are reflected in red on this proof here on the left. So what exactly did Fadden change? Let's start with the obvious. We can see that Fadden crossed out each use of the word rebels and changed it to Americans and all of the explanations as well as the map's title. We can also see that the date has changed from April 13th, 1778 to April 13th, 1784. Four days prior, on April 9th, 1784, Great Britain formally ratified the Treaty of Paris. Whether this change actually occurred on April 13th, 1784 is unlikely, but the correction now reflects a date after the ratification of the treaty, hence the change from rebels to Americans, as the term was no longer accurate nor appropriate. We also see that Fadden added geographer to the king as he was officially given that title in 1783. The explanation from Werner's plan at the bottom doesn't change, and neither does Fadden's understanding of his name. Uh, but the note referencing his, his responsibility for that section shifts to the top left corner of the map. The majority of Fadden's corrections and updates actually relate to the northern section of the battle. So let's take a closer look uh, to see what he did there. Most notable on this proof is the change of troop placements and the overhaul of the description pertaining to the northern action. We can also see that the topographical features such as trees and other hills have been added. This first notice, noticeable difference, even for somebody with the most basic understanding of the battle, is that this 1784 map correct, correctly shows Cornwallis's uh, column deployed on either side of Birmingham Road, as I pointed out before. Um, and uh, it also shows uh, the troops, uh, the Continental Forces under Sullivan being placed uh, farther back uh, behind Birmingham uh, Meeting House. Another notable change was uh, that was made uh, surrounded the village of Dilworth and to the south of that location. Uh, but this area of the map depicts the locations of the army after the battle uh, during the five day encampment rather than on September 11th itself. One can see the pickets posted on the east side of Dilworth, the location of the artillery park, and the position of the 4th Brigade and the, and the Grenadiers, as this is the location they ended up after they walked right into the jaws of the American rearguard in the battle's uh, final hours. These changes are oddly specific and had to have come from a specific source. So where was he getting this information from? That's the big question. As with the 1778 map, the description is key. Now, Fadden's new version, if you can follow along with me, reads, The column under General Howe, having crossed at 11 o'clock, the first branch of Brandywine Creek at James Trimble's Ford, halted at A, continued its march at 2 o'clock, crossed the other branch of the creek at B, and halted at a second, uh, second time at C to reconnoiter the position of the enemy, which was posted at D, or the Ds. The general formed three columns, ease, having left the 3rd Brigade on the height to cover the equipages. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the three columns advanced by F, and the middle column being arrived in G. The Brigade of Hessian Grenadiers, under the command of uh, Colonel Dunup, was detached by H. This column having deployed itself in I, the general attack began. The enemy was forced to leave the field of battle and to retire by K, being briskly, uh, briskly pursued, but perceiving the 2nd Battalion of English Grenadiers without support, some of the flying brigades rallied in L and fell up, uh, uh, up on the battalion in M. The 4th Brigade came to the assistance of the Grenadiers, and the enemy, after uh, obstinate defense, was forced to fly again, and the affair was decided. Now, the first change in this description that caught my eye is the reference to this small creek. 
that you see on the screen here. And this is an accurate depiction of what is today known as Radley Run. Fadden shows it on his 1778 map, but it's not denoted as anything important. On this 1784 map, it is. For some reason, Fadden thought that this was now the East Branch of the Brandywine or Jeffrey's Ford, which is entirely inaccurate. Additionally, Cornwallis's column only stopped once in that area to rest before the battle. This, is, this special but false note of Radley Run led to the discovery of, Fladden, of Fadden's influence. It turns out that these changes stem from Werner, the, the Hessian from which um, Fadden used for the bottom portion of his 78 map. Also housed in the Hessian State Archives with his sketch manuscript uh, that influenced, again, the 1778 map is another map that's attributed to Werner and another Hessian cartographer, Captain Reinhard Jacob Martin, who was deputy quartermaster of the Hessian forces and attached to Knipphausen's staff. Through further investigation, Martin was one of the main contributors of, of recording Hessian involvement throughout the war. And there are several maps that he and Werner collaborated on, including this one, where Werner uh, produced the map and Martin wrote the explanation, which happens to be in French. Now, Martin also signed his explanation with New York, April 6, 1779. Now, thanks to a recent translation, uh, to, from French to English by uh, Dr. Robert Selig, I was easily able uh, to see that the explanation produced by Martin directly influenced Fadden's changes for his 1784 version of the map. Now, to show this, let's compare Martin's description with Fadden's uh, updated version. Martin's explanation reads, the column of General Cornwallis having crossed it at 11, the first branch of the Brandywine makes a halt at H, resumes its march at two in the afternoon, cross the other branch of that river at I, and once again makes uh, a halt at K to reconnoiter the position of the enemy posted at L. The General, uh, the general Howe formed three columns and made them advance at four in the afternoon via M, having arrived at N, he deploys in line and begins to the he begins the general attack. The Brigade of Guards, the Hessian Grenadiers, and the 1st Battalion of English Grenadiers and the 1st Battalion of Light Infantry take after the enemy had been obliged to cede the battlefield to us, the route of O. The Chasseurs, the 2nd uh, Battalion Light Infantry, the 2nd Battalion English Grenadiers, and the 4th Brigade, that of P, the right wing of the enemy, having taken a second position at Q, was dislodged by the Chasseurs and the 2nd Battalion Light Infantry. The enemy, while retreating, saw the 2nd Battalion English Grenadiers advance too fast without any support, formed a few brigades at R, and threw itself on that battalion at S. But the 4th Brigade, having arrived, was forced to retire. The 2nd Battalion Light Infantry, the 2nd Battalion English Grenadiers, and the 4th Brigade, finding a new corps of the enemy posted to cover their retreat, attacked it and forced it to ret retreat at sunset. Now, as you can see, these are very similar. You can also see that the true positions around uh, Dilworth are almost identical as they both reflect the same positioning of the artillery park, the light infantry or chasseurs to the east of Dilworth, the Hessian Grenadiers, the 4th Brigade and the British Grenadiers. Aside from different sentence structures and words, James Trimble's Ford is pretty specific. Uh, so Fadden, we know Fadden had to have been uh, getting his information uh, from other sources as well. Uh, we can now conclusively say with these similarities that Fadden relied heavily on Werner and Martin's map. I do have to point out a major issue, though, that I found with all the maps that I've showed you today. Uh, there is one key omission of an important road that would have existed in 1777, and that is the Marble Street Road that is denoted by the red arrows. Uh, Oh, there we go. That is denoted by the red arrows. Uh, as another reference point circled below the arrows on each map is a small plot of land. That is the Jones's farm. Uh, the Jones family were one of the oldest families to settle in this region of Chester County, and the Marble Street Road is also one of the oldest uh, roads in the, in the region, predating 1707. Now, looking at the, the 18th century roadmap again, one can clearly see that this was a major artery that isn't reflected on any of Fadden's maps, nor is it reflected on Martin and Werner's map. Again, circled in red is the Jones property, uh, and the line running east to west is the street road, Marlboro Street Road uh, that ran down the Jones property to the Brandywine River, crossing at Jones's Ford, one of the northern fords that Washington had to have guarded or did guard. 
This omission is quite peculiar as the British would have had to have crossed the, the Marlboro Street Road during their assault on Birmingham Hill. And the fact that each of these maps omit it only adds to the argument that they are all related. So an, uh, an important question is why did Fadden use or rely on a 1779 Hessian map to influence uh, his uh, his corrections and additions. One answer uh, stems from Montresor, could stem from Montresor's employment of all the qualified persons to sketch the landscape following the battle. Montresor, Werner, and Martin would have certainly collaborated on Montresor's final topographical survey with Werner and Martin more than likely having access to a copy since Martin was attached to Knipphausen's staff. But the previous use and connection to Werner's uh, the explanation and sketch the fact that Werner and Martin's likely use of uh, likely used uh, Montresor's topographical survey to produce their map along uh, although it's not obviously drawn to the same scale and that the, the fact that the two were there to witness the battle and the landscape it is highly probable that Fadden thought it the, thought it the most valid um, to use uh, for his updated uh, map now, following that same process, thought process, however, another question arises. Why wouldn't Fadden use an English survey from somebody who was also a witness of the battle, was employed to sketch the same ground, and was most likely involved in the collaborative effort of producing Montresor's final survey following the Battle of Brandywine? By 1784, Fadden was clearly geographer to the king and would have had access to materials that were making their way back to England, including his sketch plan produced by Archibald Robertson, that you see right here, uh, which, who again was Montresor's right-hand man. This map that is and was part of the royal map collection of King George III at Windsor Castle, um, as King George was diligent uh, with his map compilations. So um, Archibald's map would have probably been there for Fadden's use. Additionally, since Werner and Martin died in 1781 and a 1780 respectively, what German map makers or make uh, what German map maker or makers was Fadden getting this 1779 from? What other sources was he using to plug in specific information like J uh, James Trimble's Ford, which is very, again, very specific. Uh, and most importantly, was this 1784 map mass produced and to what extent and if not, why? After an in-depth search, uh, there surprisingly appear to be no other copies of the 1784 or the final 1784 map uh, anywhere in any other collections of any other institution. The Royal Map Collection at Windsor Castle that owns a copy of the 1778 map doesn't even own it. Furthermore, in 1845, a reprint of Fadden's North American Atlas containing his most popular maps of the Revolution uses the 1778 version of the Battle of Brandywine and not the 1784 map. Even a simple Google search of William Fadden's 1784 map will only yield images of the, 84, of the 1784 engraver's proof from the Library of Congress. Why is this? Could it be that Fadden was trying to remain optimistic about the outcome of the war, that he updated a major British victory with the intention of mass producing it and just never did? Was it deemed inappropriate to print a battle map depicting a major British victory over the Americans uh, as it would sour potential relations with the new nation um, that was just establishing themselves on the world stage? Now, as I previously stated, this is still a work in progress, and I intend to dive deeper on it to answer these questions. But despite all the questions that I just posed, we at least now know, after a long period of time, the answers to the bigger questions surrounding the sources of information that influence each of Fadden's maps depicting uh, Brandywine that allow us to investigate further. We are very fortunate to have a copy of both of these maps in our library collections, especially the 1784 version, as it allows us to compare these two maps produced by the same maker six years apart and offers a better understanding surrounding the production and thought process used to create them. Most importantly, being able to see the amount of changes between two maps can be a valuable lesson uh, when dealing with maps from this period. Basically, question everything and never base information off one individual depiction. Uh, so with that, thank you all again for attending and uh, yeah, thanks again. <laughs>